The Legend of Zelda. Since 1986, this monumental franchise has spanned every Nintendo console made and released, I don't know, like 20 titles. This of course has sprouted up millions of fans of the series and in a series with that many games, you're gonna get your fair share of favoritism. I asked some of the folks on Twitter what their favorite of the series was and I got some mixed results. Breath of the Wild took the poll, but a lot of people voiced their opinion in the comments. Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess, Link to the Past, and Wind Waker were all voted as the best of the franchise. And just so we're clear, defining the best game of, well, anything factors in a lot of opinions. What rules and parameters chosen to define the best game is up to that person deciding. It really is just what aspect of the game matters to them the most when they're deciding. So with that said, Majora's Mask is the best Legend of Zelda game ever. Fight me. The year 2000. The console <laughs> Smack dab between the release of Ocarina of Time and Wind Waker, Majora's Mask poked its little head out and intrigued the little 8 year old Hammers to pick it up and play the sequel to Ocarina of Time, a game that he loved so much. The result? A lot of rage. This game was hard man, I hopped into it expecting the same stuff as Ocarina of Time, but now there's this creepy moon and after making a bunch of progress over 3 in game days, that moon crashes into Termina and I lose all my shit and essentially start the game over. I was upset, and my stupid little 8 year old brain couldn't comprehend the rudimentary time management that this game required. As the years went on I would revisit this game and it quickly became one of my favorites of all time, easily my favorite of the Legend of Zelda franchise, and even playing through it this year, 20 years after release, I'm absorbing more and more out of the title and becoming just enthralled in it. It wasn't a monumental change to the series technically, I mean hell, it used the same engine as Ocarina of Time and it reused nearly all the assets. It did call for a little 4 megabyte expansion pack for the N64, one of the 3 games that actually required it alongside Donkey Kong 64 and Perfect Dark, but that was just due to graphics and textures. It had an extremely short development period as well. Even with the reuse of Ocarina of Time's assets and engine, it's a game that probably shouldn't exist, but it does. And it's my favorite of the franchise, and in my opinion, the best of the franchise. So let's just dive into why this black sheep of the series is so great. Compared to the Zelda games at the time, Majora's Mask was radically different. There has been more Zelda titles since that dabbled in dark imagery, but in the year 2000, Link was just a little hero boy saving princesses and such. Majora's Mask is dark. The overarching theme of the game is grief and despair. Instead of Hyrule, this game takes place in an alternate reality of sorts in a land called Termina. Termina exists in a perpetual three day limbo. Three days starting from when Link enters Clock Town for the first time to a destructive apocalypse after the moon crashes into Termina. Termina at the end of the third day. This creates a unique atmosphere and vibe to the whole game, but one of the more notable feelings you get from the start is just the sheer creepiness of everything. The creepy mask salesman, the creepy music man, the creepy thief, these creepy sea snakes, these creepy fishermen asking for pictures of female pirates, this creepy fan of Lulu trying to break into her dressing room so he can breathe the same air as her, this fucking hand coming from the toilet, the moon, yes this moon with the face just looming above for the whole goddamn game. It's just creepy. This is such a minor thing, but it leaves such a profound impact on the game. Ask people what they remember about Majora's Mask the last time they played it, and it'll undoubtedly have something to do with how creepy and unsettling it was. This aids in the atmosphere of the game, it aids in the feeling of grief being forced upon the player through the narrative. The NPCs of the game are a big part in defining this feeling as well, particularly in how they react to this ever looming dooming. Many people think nothing's gonna happen with the moon, some say they'll slice it in two if it gets too close but in those final hours as the clock ticks down, those same people are cowering in their closets. You witness the day-to-day -day happenings of characters as this three-day cycle just ticks along. If the player chooses to do nothing and not interact with anybody, the cycle remains unchanged and the characters go through their days unaffected by the player. If the player chooses to help or to talk to these people, the cycle is broken and new outcomes occur. Because of this, the time loop recurring of days and events, the player learns a lot about these characters and receives 
receives information that is crucial in progressing. However, in Majora's Mask, the intimate nature caused by the three day repeating cycle makes it crucial that the player understands these NPCs habits, their personalities, and even interests to progress throughout the game. The player becomes invested in these characters and empathetic to their desires and their own griefs. The battle against evil and the apocalypse becomes much more personal to both Link and the player because it's not just innocent lives saved, but it's friends. The oppressive nature of the game lends to the atmosphere as well. From the moment you enter Clock Town for the first time, you see the moon and the clock. The clock moves forward no matter what. You can slow time down, but you can never stop it. And as that time ticks on, the moon inches forward as well. Literally the whole game, this feeling is there. You have to gauge what quests you're going to do and what you're going to explore. Because if you get halfway through a dungeon and you only have a few minutes left, you're starting that dungeon over. In all the Zelda games, if Link fails his quest, the world falls to darkness. But most of the time, that darkness isn't breathing down your neck for the entirety of the game. And furthermore, the world ending because you failed usually isn't depicted either. But in Majora's Mask, your potential failure is front and center. The darkness, creepiness, and tension are all made clear as soon as the game starts and continues strong through the end. And the atmosphere they provide alone makes Majora's Mask such a stark contrast to the rest of the series. There's the dark world in A Link to the Past, there's the Twilight Realm and Twilight Princess, and of course the Shadow Temple's eerie atmosphere in Ocarina of Time, but Majora's Mask borderlines on horror, never quite stepping over the line, but it creates a much much more dark atmosphere compared to the rest. Like I said earlier, this is not a hero's quest. Link isn't saving any princesses. Well, he helps one for a bit by shoving her into a bottle, but that's besides the point. This is Link's journey, a wholly selfish affair that starts shortly after the timeline of Ocarina of Time as he is wandering around looking for his lost fairy Navi. While searching through the woods, Link is jumped by a little masked bastard that steals both Link's horse and his ocarina. Link chases down this thief way down and confronts him. Not realizing the power that he's dealing with, he is then transformed into a Deku scrub, going through a feverish nightmare similar to his nightmare of Ganon on the opening of an Ocarina of Time. Deku scrub Link continues to follow the masked marauder until coming to the doors of Clock Town and meeting the creepy, I mean, happy mask salesman, who informs him that the thief is Skull Kid and he's wearing a stolen mask called Majora's Mask. The mask salesman asks you to help him get the mask back for him. You find your way to the Skull Kid at the end of the third day on top of the clock tower. You have a brief little scuffle, but you can't really beat him as a Deku scrub. He does, however, drop your ocarina, allowing you to start this three-day cycle over as Link and also having the knowledge to recruit help from four friends in the surrounding areas of Termina. These four friends being these no torso having giant. So you go about Termina to these areas correcting the evil that Skull Kid has subjected to them and recruiting these four giants to stop the moon crashing to earth. This is an extremely brief overview of the plot but it gives an idea of just how different the plot of this game is to all other Zelda titles. Skull Kid is a more complex and ultimately more sympathetic foil to Link compared to say Ganon or any of his incantations. Up until Majora's Mask the series didn't offer any deep or elaborative narrative it was just a hero's journey. Always a princess in danger, always an evil force to be slain, and a young warrior put through a test of skill and eventually a triumphant conclusion. Majora's Mask was not driven by Link being a hero. It was Link trying to find his fairy and then trying to get his horse and ocarina back. Meanwhile, being roped into this town's trouble and sent out to fix it all so he can continue on with what he was doing. This game took a closer look at feelings, at thoughts, at worries, at the psyche of these characters in the game. Ganon was always the go-to bad guy, but but when you get into Clock Town and you see that fucking moon, my god, Ganon looks like a little bitch. And unlike Ganon, this moon is daunting and oppressive at all times. When the day first dawns, he is literally staring down at you every moment of the game. Whether you're in the swamp or in the snowy mountaintops, there he is, reminding you that no matter what you do, in three days, I'ma get that ass. I'll get you, bitch! Even Skull Kid, who would be the real antagonist of the game, is a more vivid and interesting character than anything the series has offered. He is a sad, lost boy who came across a mask and was used as a puppet to control the world. He transforms from that asshole that steals your shit and turns you into a Deku scrub to someone that you want to help once you find out what got him to where he is, what corrupted him, fundamentally changed him, and ultimately drowned him in madness. The mask, Majora, and Skull Kid are two drastic 
drastically different characters not seen in the Zelda franchise. Ganon has been in way too many games as the main villain and so little is known about him. He is always just the embodiment of ultimate evil. He is the bad man who do bad things. He lacks personality. He lacks motive. He's just an archetype. Other villains like Zant from Twilight Princess have some more defined motives and an interesting backstory but it's never framed properly to even take serious. Skull Kid is broken and dangerous making him more compelling than any antagonist before or after. The rest of this discussion more or less bleeds into gameplay so instead of bundling it all up I'm just gonna separate Majora's Mask balances two main systems on top of the existing gameplay present in Ocarina of Time. A constantly running clock and a mask collection system that adds variety to gameplay and mechanics. The time mechanic adds such a sense of urgency to everything, but when in combination with dungeons, it's something magical. You can't slow crawl through dungeons, taking your time, trying to get all these fairies scattered about. Nah man, you gotta go. You gotta solve these puzzles, you gotta slap these bosses. When there's this annoying freaking frog that won't die, you gotta start to raise a little bit but it's all because of the clock time is moving the more you fail at puzzles and you can't quite get the boss fights down the closer that moon inches and it's just freaking stressful okay that doesn't take away from the dungeons and boss fights in their own right they are some of the best in the franchise i mean aside from this fish they're incredibly unique and worthwhile to go through even when stressed out by them you can't help but admire the care that went into the design of it all the masks add another level of experimentation to going about areas, swapping out all the masks, seeing what works where and how something may affect the outcome. Once I found out you can wear the stone mask into the pirate fortress, I was floored. That place was so annoying, trying to avoid the pirates because you just can't kill them. You have to knock them out and sneak by them and you don't really know where the hell you're going and then you just pop on the stone mask and walk around like you're one of the ladies. It's kind of frustrating actually. Those masks all serve a purpose, no matter how minute it may seem, they are necessary to complete some kind of quest or to get some kind of reward. Being a wolf in Twilight Princess or on a boat in Wind Waker are cool and all, but have you ever sewn a dead dancer's face to your forehead to pick up some twin chicks before? I didn't think so. On top of these two pivotal mechanics, the side quests of Majora's Mask are crank up to 11, some being incredibly lengthy, but not feeling padded with fetch quests or collecting X number of this and that. It's hard not to get wrapped up in various NPCs affairs, and Nintendo pushes you to get involved. Even on such a strict time constraint, it's hard not to care about the outcome of countless people that you encounter in turn. The last thing you do before the moon crashes into earth is help a man see his chicks all grown into happy chickens and you feel fulfilled in that. There's no other way you would rather spend the end of the world. The complexity of the side missions lends tremendously to the feeling of Majora's Mask. It breaks up the repetitive nature of going to area, entering dungeon, doing puzzles, slapping boss, and then repeat. Breath of the Wild is one of the only other Zelda games to branch out with side quests to such an extent, but a lot of these thread the line of being collectathons or fetch quests instead of becoming personally involved with an NPC and solving their grievances, which is what Majora's Mask is all about. The symbolism in this game is like the sprinkling on top of what is already a badass glazed donut. This sort of feeds from the atmosphere of the game, but I thought I'd elaborate on it a little more at the end after discussing some more broad aspects of the game like plot and gameplay. I guess this is more like Atmosphere Part 2. Stop! It's the motherfucking remix! Oh! Majora's Mask was marketed toward a young crowd, but that didn't take away from the more mature imagery that this game had to offer. Little things like the creepy fisherman in Great Bay that asks you to take some pictures of the pirate ladies to more profound things like, well, death. Death is a huge part in this game. In fact, all the main masks that are required to progress through each area are tied to death. The three transformative masks, the Goron mask, the Zora mask, and the Deku mask are all linked to death, which facilitates the transformation. You embody the soul of the dead when you wear these masks. The Goron mask is received from the Goron hero after coming to terms with his death. You wear this mask to help his people survive the cruel winter. The Zora mask is received after literally watching the Zora 
guitarist die in front of you. You wear this mask to help the Great Bay and Lulu by getting her eggs back. The Deku mask, while it is received after the mask salesman helps you remove it initially, it is still tied to a death. The Deku butler that you meet in the swamp tells a story of his son that left home and never came back. That tree that you see briefly at the beginning while chasing Skull Kid into Clock Town, that's the Deku butler's son. His soul is tied to the Deku mask, and you can see the Deku butler weeping at his son's corpse in the credits. The whole idea of masks in the game is alluded to the theoretical masks that people wear during different situations in order to save face or to get something that they need. The Lunar Children at the end impose some of the most existential crisis inducing questions like your true face. What kind of face is it? I wonder, the face under the mask, is that your true face? The player throughout the game becomes accustomed to wearing these masks in order to progress, but is wearing these masks and evoking responses from the characters really the right thing to be doing? Death is one of the main themes of the game, but so is grief. There's a theory that each region of the game is tied to the five stages of grief. Clocktown is denial, no one wants to admit that the moon is falling, the swamp is anger, the Deku scrubs want to kill the monkey, and they blame him for all their problems. Snowhead is bargaining. The freezing and starving Gorons hope that their hero will return to save them. The Great Bay is depression. The Zoras lost their guitarist and Lulu lost her eggs. She's so sad that she won't even speak. And the iconic canyon is acceptance. The spirits and souls there move on after they come to terms with their death and how everything they had fell apart because of their inability to let go of grief. So many other seemingly small details can weigh so heavily on the NPC sees as Link is there to intervene. Like the daughter crying out for her father after he is changed into a Gibdo. She is alone in this house in a canyon of death and her own father is turning into a monster. She's helpless and Link is there to save her. Helping the girl on the farm against the invasion from them, the unnamed alien creatures that come to abduct cows one night a year is super creepy. But if you decide not to help them, it's almost just as creepy. The little girl seems empty, like a shell of her Herself. The alien seemingly abducted the cows and her and did who knows what to make her how she is now. There's just so many dark undertones throughout the game. It's hard not to try to read too deeply into everything. That's how we end up with game theory videos, I guess, but it's undoubtedly a good thing that this game inspires so much thought and interpretation, even 20 years later, offering amazing discussion and theory crafting. Yo, it's the, the, the Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild. Oh my god, yo! Before we wrap this all up, I thought it'd be best to share some of my thoughts on Breath of the Wild since it was the top voted best game of the franchise by the Twitter poll. Breath of the Wild shares a lot of similar themes, ideas, and even attributes to Majora's Mask. It has a pretty heavy narrative and the events of occurrences throughout the game have an effect on the people involved. But I feel like due to Breath of the Wild being such a vast game, it sacrifices the intimacy and pacing of the story itself. It can take dozens of hours to get to a pivotal part of the plot because it's so easy to get distracted by adventuring, dungeon crawling, or I don't know, cooking, it tends to lessen the impact of the story, similar to other games with such a large scope like Skyrim or The Witcher 3. Since Mazora's Mask has such a limiting time frame from the get-go, players are focused on the world as a whole, the direct narrative of the story, and the relationships of the characters in Termina, allowing for much more emotional weight and ultimately passion for the story over Breath of the Wild. The story itself in Breath of the Wild was pretty underwhelming to me to be honest. I enjoyed the gameplay and exploration much more than any plot devices. I felt like you just uncovered memories more than pushing forward any type of narrative. And because of this, I felt it was natural to just push forward and explore, which is fun and entertaining, but it doesn't leave a lasting impact. I can't think of any NPCs in Breath of the Wild that I actually cared about. Even in the exploring, however, the world tends to feel pretty empty at times. There's a huge number of side quests and shrines and plenty to do, but they all kind of seem like carbon copies of each other. Nothing memorable to them. In a game with so much potential for a life-filled world and involved in grasping side quests, the fact that so many of them are boiled down to fetch quests or collectathons was disappointing. I love that it's not linear and there's no set path to the end. You can storm the castle right away at the beginning if you wish. It just ends up feeling a lot like lost potential in all the areas that I care about and I feel like Majora's Mask gets sold at those same areas. I value side quests and story more than 
than dungeons, so I empathize with all you dungeon crawlers out there that appreciate more dungeons to do your thing in with puzzles and shit, but it's just not my cup of tea. Not saying that Breath of the Wild is a bad game either, I love my time with it, it's just not my favorite Zelda game. I do hope that Breath of the Wild 2 takes a more narrative approach and it strikes that perfect balance between plot development and exploration, and it's the Majora's Mask to the Ocarina of Time that Breath of the Wild is. Majora's Mask failed to make the cultural impact like Ocarina of Time or the cartoonish Wind Waker, but its smart design and focus on storytelling make it far more memorable. It's hard to walk away from Majora's Mask and not make your own conclusions, especially since the ending is not exactly definite on what just happened. There hasn't been a game in the series since that has produced such an intriguing and thought-provoking story. Even without its solid gameplay mechanics, level design, and sound, Majora's Mask would still stand as one of the best Zelda experiences offered by Nintendo. The world of Termina may have descended into madness, but Majora's Mask brilliance could not be any clearer. I have a feeling most of you would disagree with me, so let's have a discussion below. What's your favorite title of the Zelda series, and why do you think it's better than Majora's Mask? Either way, I truly hope that you enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you in the next one. Peace.